All right, we will uh, start with a little prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, the Lord be with you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, open our hearts to understand more fully and more deeply the journey of the Passion. As we come to look as Luke presents it to us, may we come to understand the love you desire to sear with us through the death and resurrection of Christ. And we ask this through Christ our Lord. All right. So uh, the last two weeks we have covered the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Mark. Uh, today we will finish uh, the synoptics with the Gospel of Luke, and next week we look at the Gospel of John. So, when we begin looking at the uh, Gospel of Luke, again, I just want to sort of give an overarching view, and then we'll look directly at the Passion itself and sort of how it fits into that. Um, the, when we look at the Gospel of Luke, we have to actually look at it in the context of also the Acts of the Apostles. There's this idea that it's written by one person, well, one author covers the Luke Acts, and really they're sort of two volumes of the same book. You start with basically Jesus, and then how sort of the Jesus event brings forth and brings about the, the creation of the church. And so that's so when you look at the totality of what Luke is trying to accomplish, both through his gospel and the Acts of the Apostles, it's just sort of see how Jesus leads us to the church and how the church is just a continuation of who Jesus is and what Jesus is trying to bring about. Does that kind of make sense? Okay, so as we understand that, the other interesting thing on that is that the Luke and Acts combined make up about 25% of the New Testament. <laughs> so I, just, I don't know, I just found that was kind of fascinating. That has no point to what we're talking about tonight, but I just thought it was an interesting fact. So the writer of the gospel may well have been actually a companion of, of Paul, uh, and it appears that this gospel was most likely written somewhere around 80 to 85 AD. So it would be essentially the third gospel written. First Mark, then Matthew, Luke, and John is the, most likely the last gospel written of the, of the four. And Luke is most likely writing for a Gentile audience, uh, not mainly because of the way he explains things and his emphasis actually on the Gentiles in many ways is what makes them think that the Gentile audience was really who Luke was trying to explain sort of the Jesus, Jesus event to. And with that, we also see though that he, he has a connection with Christian life because he really does have a deep understanding of the scripture traditions. And so all of this uh, comes together in how Luke will sort of lay out his story of Jesus, which is the way he does it is different than the way Matthew and Mark would do it. Mark is kind of sparse on his, how he describes things. He's just sort of, here are the facts, let's move on because we just need to get to the cross anyway. Matthew is dealing with, you know, possibly a community somewhat in turmoil, and so he's, and uh, really is deeply indebted to uh, a deeper Jewish consciousness. Well, Luke is, well, of the three of them, is a much more gifted storyteller. And so he, if you really look at the Gospel of Luke, this, it really does have a sense of a story. And those stories are very well interconnected in the way that Luke lays things out. But what is Luke trying to do? Well, there are two sort of primary things in Luke's um, narrative. He is trying to help us to understand 
God's promises and that those promises have been fulfilled in this present day. That the promises of God that, that are in the Old Testament are truly fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ and everything that will happen after Jesus. On top of that, he's trying to deal with what's called theodicy, which is a fancy term. Uh, and ultimately, it is the idea of the vindication of divine goodness and providence up against the existence of evil. So how do you explain God's goodness and providence when you have all this evil in the world? And Luke is really big on trying to help us to understand how all of that works together, particularly in the context of God's promises. All right, so that's sort of a little of the background. Again, much more we could, could be said, but I think this gives us enough of a flavor to be able to begin to unpack what we have in Luke, where the passion narrative is concerned. But I'm gonna start a little bit differently than I have in the other uh, nights with Matthew and Mark. And I'm not gonna read first from the passion. I'm actually gonna start with the very beginning of the Gospel of Luke. And when I do that, I'll explain why. And then that will lead us into beginning looking at the passion itself. Since many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the events that have been fulfilled among us, just as those who were eyewitnesses from the beginning and ministers of the word have handed them down to us, I too have decided after investigating everything accurately anew, to write it down, to write down, it down in an orderly sequence for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may realize the certainty of the teachings you have received. So when Luke begins his narrative of the Luke Acts narrative, he tells us who he's writing it for, Theophilus. And the word Theophilus means, or the name Theophilus means, friend of God. And so there are some scripture scholars who might think that Luke didn't really have a person named Theophilus who he was writing to, but rather he uses the term Theophilus as all of us, because we are tended to be friends of God. But the other important thing here is he's telling us exactly why he wrote this. So that you may realize the certainty of the teachings you have received. So that's the point Luke wants to make sure that we are, have the ammunition in a sense, that faith ammunition, to be able to stand up for what we will come to know as the truth found in Jesus. The other important thing in this is I too have decided after investigating everything accurately anew to write it down in an orderly sequence. So Luke is also telling us what? I didn't just sort of write this off of memory. I have investigated so that you can trust what it is that I have put down. So as we begin to look at the passion narrative of Luke, we need to keep that in mind. He's writing this for a friend of God, and he's doing it to bring about that certainty of teaching, that, that, you, that the faith he is presenting here, the faith truths that he is presenting, are something you can trust. Now the feast of unleavened bread called the Passover was drawing near and the chief priests and scribes were seeking a way to put him to death for they were afraid of the people. Then Satan entered into Judas, the one surnamed Iscariot, 
who was counted among the twelve. And he went to the chief priests and temple guards to discuss a plan for handing him over to them. They were pleased and agreed to pay him money. He accepted their offer and sought a favorable opportunity to hand them hand him over to them in the absence of the crowd. When the day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread arrived, the day for sacrificing the Passover lamb, he sent out Peter and John instructing them, go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. They asked him, where do you want us to make the preparations? And he answered them, when you go into the city, a man will meet you carrying a jar of water. Follow him into the house he enters and say to the master of the house, the teacher says to you, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large upper room that is furnished. Make the preparations there. Then they went off and found everything exactly as he had told them. And there they prepared the Passover. When the hour came, he took his place at table with the apostles. He said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I shall not eat it again until there is fulfillment in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup, gave thanks, and said, Take this and share it among yourselves, for I tell you that from this time on, I shall not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Then he took the bread and said the blessing, broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which will be given up for you. Do this in memory of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, This is this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which will be shed for you. And yet, behold, the hand of the one who is to betray me is with me on, this, on the table. For the Son of Man indeed goes as it has been determined. But woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to be deba debate among themselves who among them would do such a deed. So, as we sort of hear Luke, it's similar to what we've just recently heard in Mark and Matthew, but there are some differences. Number one, he tells us who the disciples are who get sent. And part of that is because one of the disciples that gets sent is Peter. Luke really likes Peter and Paul. <laughs> He's really into them. They, they show up all the time in, the, in Luke and in Acts. And so it, it's important, I think, that Peter is here because he is sort of the leader for Luke of, of the apostles up until the time Paul comes. The other thing we see here is describing why Judas does he, what he does. Satan enters into him. And I think that is also important because when we look at sort of what um, Luke is, what what is trying what Luke is trying to do here is make the connection between what's happening right now and what happened when Jesus went out into the desert because in the desert. When Jesus is out in the desert and he's having 
you know, his um, conversation with the devil about, you know, all the temptations. When it finishes, what do we hear? When the devil had finished every time, for every temptation, he departed him for a time. In other words, Luke is doing a little foreshadowing. He's like, okay, the devil didn't get, I didn't get you now. And I may not be able to get you directly. But I'm going to find someone who I can get at you. And so I think that is kind of important to recognize sort of what is going on here. So again, you see Luke doing a little foreshadowing. You see him preparing us without us even knowing that that's what he's trying to do in that moment. And so again, we see the cohesion of what Luke is trying to present here and how everything sort of fits together. So the temptation in the desert was something Jesus showed how you sort of reject Satan. And Judas doesn't do that. He accepts the offer basically from Satan. I can give you some money. And he takes it. And that's what sets up Jesus. So the passion for Jesus really begins just at the beginning of his mission. Satan tried to trip him up and it didn't work. Now he has a way to make that happen. But it's not going to quite turn out the way Satan anticipates. So Judas does what he does. And again, this is important. One, how are they going to get at Jesus without the crowd being around? Because the crowd's for Jesus. He's, you know, he's done these amazing things. And he's also talked to them about what? You're important. Don't, don't worry about what the Pharisees, the Sadducees, don't worry about what the you know, the powerful are saying about you. I'm telling you, you have value. And they liked to hear that. We all like to hear that, that we have value. There's not a, there's not a much difference in the, um, in the Passover dinner than what we've heard from Matthew and Mark. Slightly different. Uh, it's the technical differences that I'm not really going to get into because they're not overly, well, they are important, but not for what I'm trying to unpack for us uh, for tonight. But the difference is when the blessings occur. So if you sit and look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, well, John doesn't have a Last Supper per se, uh, but the meal in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Luke, Matthew, and Mark kind of go together, Luke and Paul kind of go together as to when the blessings occur in this in this whole thing. Uh, so that's really the only difference. And we, since we talked about it the last two weeks, I'm not going to focus too heavily on that. But what I what I do want us to see in all of this is something I already touched on, which is. I shall not eat it again until there is a fulfillment in the kingdom of God. As I talked about at the beginning, Luke is big about what Jesus is doing is the fulfillment of God's promises. And so Jesus makes that very clear that all of this is going to tie in together. And he's sort of projecting again, like Matthew and Mark, to the death and resurrection. Nothing is direct yet, you know, because but we can make those connections. Of course, we have the whole betrayal thing, which, which interesting is Luke sort of just passes over that in a lot of ways. And, you know, we see in Matthew and Mark, there's a, it's not me, it's not me, it's not me, it's not me. How will the disciples deal with hearing that in Luke? Let's find out. 
Then an argument broke out about them, about which of them should be regarded as the greatest. You've got to love the disciples. He said to them, the kings of the Gentiles lorded over them, and those in authority over them are dressed as benefactors. But among you it shall not be so. Rather, let the greatest among you be as the youngest, and the leader as the servant. For who is greater, the one seated at the table or the one who serves? Is not the one seated at table? I am among you as the one who serves. It is you who have stood by me in my trials, and I confer a kingdom on you, just as my Father has conferred one on me, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and you shall sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel." Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded to sift all of you like wheat. But I have prayed that your own faith may not fail. And once you have turned back, you must strengthen your brothers. He said to him, Lord, I am prepared to go to prison and to die with you. But he replied, I tell you, Peter, before the cock crows this day, you will deny me three times that you know me. He said to them, when I sent you forth without a money bag or a sack or sandals, were you in need of anything? No, nothing, they replied. He said to them, but now one of you has a money bag, should take it, and likewise a sack, and one who does not have a sword should sell his cloak and buy one. For I tell you that the scripture must be fulfilled in me, namely, he was counted among the wicked, and indeed what is written about me is coming to fulfillment. Then they said, Lord, look, there are two swords here. But he replied, it is enough. So, I know you all laughed as we started this part because we all know where this is coming. You know, Jesus tells them, someone's about to betray me and what's their concern? Which one of us is the greatest? Which one of us is the most important? Now, in Matthew and Mark, this conversation happens earlier than the Last Supper. Uh, that Luke puts it here, I think, is to help us to hear what Jesus is saying in this moment. First, who is the greatest? The one sitting at table being served or the one doing service? How would the world look at it? The one being served, obviously, because he's sitting around. Things are good for him. But what does Jesus tell us? He tells us that I am the one who is serving. I am among you as the one who serves. So Jesus is turning things on their head. And as he does that, He's doing, again, some foreshadowing here. But also some promises here that are really important. And he's pointing to what's going to come by looking at what has happened. Jesus recognizes that through this whole time, up to this point, they have faced a lot of different trials together. And again, that's important for us to understand that living the Christian life, having Jesus present in our life, doesn't guarantee our lives are going to go easy. Jesus never promises that. He always promises the exact opposite. Take up your cross and follow me. 
And we see that right now. They don't understand fully what's going on here yet. Otherwise, they probably wouldn't have had the argument they just had. And I confer a kingdom on you, just as my Father has conferred one on me. That you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and you will sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. This is Jesus pointing basically to, though a different writer, uh, the book of Revelations. Not really connected with this, but it gives us the same idea, that same promise. In the book of Revelations, we see the 12 tribes of Judah, we see, of Israel. We see the apostles sitting on the thrones. It's this idea that the kingdom doesn't end, will not end with Jesus' death. He's sort of telling them things are going to continue. We're moving in the direction of God's fulfillment, of the kingdom of God coming to its fulfillment. Don't worry. It's all going to be good. But for that to happen, you can't worry about who the greatest is. Because you're called to serve. That's your responsibility. And of course, poor Simon. You know, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to go to prison for you. I'm really going to die for you. It's, it's all good, Lord. You've got me. And Jesus is just like, uh, no. No, that's not going to happen. But again, Peter's importance in all of this and preparing actually. And again, when, when you probably first heard this, it, you're not connecting it to the Acts of the Apostles. But this promise to Peter is very important, and it's one of those things that I think really can be missed. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded to sift all of you like wheat, but I have prayed that your own faith may not fail, and once you have turned back, you must strengthen your brothers. So what is Jesus telling him? Yep. You're about to mess up. I know you're about to mess up. But don't worry. You're going to turn back. You're going to come back to me. Because you're the one who is going to be the support to your brothers. So again, we're seeing what Peter's role will be moving forward that role of leadership that will be so important to the continuation of Christ's mission when he ascends to heaven. Then going out, he went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives. And the disciples followed him. When he arrived at the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not undergo the test. After withdrawing about a stone's throw from them and kneeling, he prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, take this cup away from me. Still, not my will, but yours be done. And to strengthen him, an angel from heaven appeared to him. He was in such agony, he prayed so fervently that his sweat became like drops of blood falling on the ground. When he rose from prayer and returned to the disciples, he found them sleeping from grief. He said to them, why are you sleeping? Get up and pray that you may not undergo the test. While he was still speaking, a crowd approached, and in front was one of the twelve, a man named Judas. He went up to Jesus to kiss him. Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? His disciples realized what was about to happen, and they asked, Lord, shall we strike with a sword? 
And one of them struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. But Jesus said in reply, stop, no more of this. Then he touched the servant's ear and healed him. And Jesus said to the chief priests and temple guards and elders who had come for him, Have you come out as against a robber? With swords and clubs, day after day, I was with you in the temple area, and you did not seize me. But this is your hour, the time for the power of darkness. So, in Matthew and Mark, what do we hear? Jesus goes back and forth. You know, he prays, he comes back, he prays, he comes back, he prays, he comes back. Well, that doesn't happen this time. It's just once. You know, but again, it's important what he says to them. Pray that you may not undergo the test. Jesus is again trying to prepare the disciples for what is about to happen. And quite frankly, what they were about to do. Now, you don't have them all running away like you do in Matthew and Mark. But clearly, as we move on, we're going to see they're not there with him either. Luke doesn't bother to tell us what they do. But I think it's clear, he's making clear what's coming and that Essentially, as we hear the story of Peter, they fail the test because they didn't pray. Jesus told them exactly what to do, and they didn't do it. And with that, he's telling them what's going to happen if you don't do this. Pray that you don't fail. They don't pray, and so what do they do? They fail. And so we again see Jesus preparing his disciples for what's coming. And I think a part of that is, again, to get them ready for what happens later. Yep, you're going to fail. You're going to mess up. Guess what? That's true of us. But there's another part. Your failure is not the end of the story. And that's what we will see with them. But first, after arresting him, they led him away and took him into the house of the high priest. Peter was following at a distance. They lit a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat around it. And Peter sat down with them. When a maid saw him seated in the light, she looked intently at him and said, This is... Man, too, was with him. But he denied it, saying, Woman, I do not know him. A short while later, someone else saw him and said, You, too, are one of them. But but Peter answered, My friend, I am not. About an hour later, still another insisted, Assuredly, this man too was with him, for he also is a Galilean. But Peter said, My friend, I do not know what you are talking about. Just as he was saying this, the cock crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said to him, Before the cock crows today, you will deny me three times. He went out and began to weep bitterly. The men who had held Jesus in custody were ridiculing and beating him. They blindfolded him and questioned him, saying, Prophesy! Who is it that struck you? And they reviled him and saying many other things against him. When day came, the council of elders of the people met, both chief priests and scribes, 
and they brought him before their Sanhedrin. They said, if you are the Messiah, tell us. But he replied to them, if I tell you, you will not believe. And if I question you, you will not respond. But from this time on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the power of God. They all, they all asked, are you then the Son of God? He replied to them, you say that I am. Then they said, what further need have we for testimony? We have heard it from his own mouth. So, what's interesting in Peter's denial is this little thing that Luke talks about. And it kind of tells us how close Peter must have been to Jesus in that moment. Because just as he was saying this, the cock crowed and the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter wept bitterly. As we hear that, you know, again, much of what's said here is not diff much different than Matthew and Mark, but that little piece. Again, if we look back to what, is, what already Jesus had foretold, okay, you're, you're going to fail here, but you're going to be able to turn around. And I think Peter begins that, believe it or not, by weeping for his sin. In that moment, he shows true contrition. And that is so important in our relationship with the Lord, is our willingness to show that same kind of contrition. And as Jesus is arrested, they immediately start basically torturing him. And then they bring him before the Sanhedrin, Again, the Sanhedrin is the religious authorities, essentially, kind of like their, their Senate or their government, their local religious government. And as he's brought, you know, again, in Matthew and Mark, what do we hear? We have all of these people trying to trip Jesus up. They're trying to get him. Uh, they're using false witnesses. None of that happens in Luke. Luke keeps it much simpler. And he gets to the point and one of the pieces, I think, again, that we can easily miss is the statement from Jesus. But from this time on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the power of God. In that statement, Jesus is equating himself with God. And the Sanhedrin gets that. They understand that. That's why they ask, are you then the Son of God? They understand what Jesus is implying. He didn't say it directly, but the implication is there. And for the Jews, there could be no greater blasphemy or what we would call heresy than what Jesus has just said. Now again, we know the truth of the situation. They don't have the faith to see who it is that is before them. And so they say, you know, Jesus' reply is, you say that I am. I didn't exactly say that. But they also get what Jesus is doing here. And so now they have all that they need. They have to put this one to death. Then the whole assembly of them arose and brought him before Pilate. They brought charges against him, saying... We found this man misleading our people. He opposes the payment of taxes to Caesar and maintains that he is the Messiah, a king. Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? 
He said to him in reply, You say so. Pilate then addressed the chief priests and the crowds. I find this man not guilty. But they were adamant and said, He is inciting the people with his teaching throughout all Judea from Galilee where he began even to hear. On hearing this, Pilate asked if the man was a Galilean. And upon learning that he was under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was in Jerusalem at that time. Herod was glad to see Jesus. He had been wanting to see him for a long time, for he had heard about him and been hoping to see him perform some sign. He questioned him at length, but he gave him no answer. The chief priests and scribes, meanwhile, stood by accusing him harshly. Even Herod and his soldiers treated him contemptuously and mocked him, and after clothing him in resplendent garb, he sent him back to Pilate. Herod and Pilate became friends that very day, even though they had been enemies formerly. Pilate then summoned the chief priests and the rulers and the people and said to them, You brought this man to me and accused him of assigning the people to revolt. I have conducted my investigation in your presence and have not found this man guilty of the charges you brought against him, nor did Herod, for he sent him back to us. So no capital crime has been committed by him. Therefore, I shall have him flogged and then release him. But altogether they shouted, Away with this man! Release Barabbas to us! Now Barabbas had been imprisoned for a rebellion that had taken place in the city and for murder. Again, Pilate addressed them, still wishing to release Jesus. But they continued their shouting, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate addressed them a third time. What evil has this man done? I find him guilty of no capital crime. Therefore, I shall have him flogged and then resist him. Without shouts, however, they persisted in calling for his crucifixion. And their voices prevailed. The verdict of Pilate was that their demand should be granted. So he released the man who had been imprisoned for rebellion and murder, for whom they asked. And he handed Jesus over to them to deal with as they wished. Now there's a whole lot in this part that we just uh, listened to. And some of it is interesting. You know, again, it, some of it points back to, to stories we've heard in Luke. Um, we found this man lis- misleading our people. He opposes the payment of taxes to Caesar. And that should remind us of what Jesus actually said. Give unto Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Give unto God what belongs to God. He never said, he was never opposed to the taxes of Caesar. Jesus really didn't care. That wasn't important to his message. God doesn't really care if we pay taxes. I mean, we should pay our taxes because it's the legal thing to do. Jesus would want us to do that. And that's the whole point. But even as they bring Jesus to Pilate, They can't tell Pilate the real reason he's there. The real reason he's there is because for them, he's a blasphemer of the worst kind. And he has to die for that. So they have to come up with other reasons for Jesus to die. Now we know in Luke, he has never incited the crowds. That has never happened. And yet that's what they accuse him of. And he has actually never technically claimed himself as king. But they figure, hey, 
this is the way we're going to get Pilate to, you know, come to our side. Because the last thing Caesar wants is a rival king. The last thing Caesar wants, I mean, because quite frankly, the area of Israel for the Romans is important for one reason. And really only one reason. It's not a wealthy section of the empire by any stretch of the imagination. But it connects two of the wealthy sections of the empire together. That's why it's so important to the Romans. Because it, and it completes their control of the Mediterranean. So, you know, so it's important to them as a crossroads. But the problem is the Jews are always going into rebellion. All, there's always fermenting going on there, which is a problem for the Roman authorities. To the point that in AD 70, they will completely destroy the city of Jerusalem. But that's not the only rebellion. There's multiple, there are rebellions before Jesus is even born. There's rebellions after even 70 AD. The Israelites, the Jews, want freedom from the Romans. And so the Sanhedrin sort of plays off of that. But their problem is Pilate doesn't take them at their word. Pilate instead, okay, let's do a little investigation here. Let's find out what's actually going on here. And when he realizes he's innocent, but these people won't leave him alone. And he finds out, oh, he's a Galilean. Oh, he's not my problem. That, that's a different territory. I'll send him to Herod. Herod has to deal with this. And of course, Herod, let's just say he doesn't have a very strong backbone. And so Herod, again, has this sort of conversation with Jesus. It's kind of one-sided because Jesus has just decided... I'm done, I'm not talking to you either. <laughs> and so what happens is Herod is like, okay, I'm going to make him look foolish because I can, because, well, I'm powerful and wealthy, and, and so they do just that, and then he sends him back. He's like, I don't want to deal with this. Pilate, it's your problem. <laughs> And so what happens? Pilate finally gives in. He finally gives in and is just like, okay, this is basically one man. No, he's not guilty of any crime. Yes, he's completely innocent. But I just don't care. <laughs> it's just not worth the bother. But on top of that, it is interesting. The very thing that they are claiming that Jesus is done. Fermented rebellion is exactly what the man they release has actually done. So, they kill the man who's innocent, they let the man go free who's actually rebelled and murdered. And that's not just, you know, a casual aspersion that, that Luke is putting there. That juxtaposition is intended. Because again, remember, what is he trying to do? To show where goodness comes from and where evil actually comes from. And this is the place where we really see it come to fruition. Because Jesus already told us back a little ways that darkness has now taken over. Right? So where is the evil coming from? Us. None of this that's happening is being caused by God. Like, every step of the way, Jesus' innocence is pretty clear. The evil is coming from us and from the evil one. We don't need to look to God to discover evil in the world and where it arrives from. 
This is making it clear. As they led him away, they took hold of a certain Simon, a Cyrenian, who was coming from the country. And after laying the cross on him, they made him carry it behind Jesus. A large crowd of people followed Jesus, including many women who mourned and lamented him. Jesus turned to them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep instead for yourselves and for your children. For indeed, the days are coming when people will say, Blessed are the barren, the wombs that never bore, and the breasts that never nursed. At that time, people will say to the mountains, Fall upon us, and to the hills, cover us. For if these things were done when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? Now two others, both criminals, were led away with him to be executed. The crucif- when they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him. And the criminals there, one on his right, the other on his left, And Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. They divided his garments by casting lots. The people stood by and watched. The rulers, meanwhile, sneered at him and said, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is the chosen one, the Messiah of God. Even the soldiers jeered at him. As they approached to offer him wine, they called out, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. Above him, there was an inscription that read, This is the king of the Jews. Now, one of the criminals hanging there reviled Jesus, saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. The other, however, rebuking him, said in reply, Have you no fear of God? For you are subject to the same condemnation. Indeed, we have been condemned justly for the sentence we received corresponds to our crimes. But this man has done nothing criminal. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He replied to him, Amen, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. It was about noon and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon because of an eclipse of the sun. Then the veil of the temple was torn down the middle. Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And when he had said this, he breathed his last. The centurion who witnessed what had happened glorified God and said, This man was innocent beyond doubt. When all the people who had gathered for this spectacle saw what had happened, they returned home beating their breast. But all his acquaintances stood at a distance, including the women who had followed him from Galilee and saw these events. So again, we hear about Simon, you know, And what we also see, though, is this little difference. It's as Jesus is making his way, the crowd is with him still. The crowd really hasn't deserted him in Luke. 
daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep instead for yourselves and for your children. For indeed, the days are coming when people will say, blessed are the barren and the womb that never bore and the breast that never nursed. As we hear what Jesus is saying in this moment, it is the pain of coming to recognize what has happened, what it is that we did in that moment. We tried to kill God. And almost in a sense, that's what we do every time we sin. We're God, you're not. I'm in control of my life. You're not. And our life gets messed up when that happens. And what we see, you know, as Jesus is being crucified, the the soldiers are jeering at him. Everyone is making fun of him. We have again this call. Come down. Save yourself. Make this about you. And if Jesus did that, we would have been in deep, deep trouble. Jesus was making it about us. And again, we have, I mean, I think we've all heard, know this story well enough of the the good thief. But what's really important here is, again, what do we hear? The innocence of Jesus. Indeed, we have been condemned justly for the sentence we received corresponds to our crimes, but this man has done nothing criminal. He recognizes again the truth of who Jesus is. He recognizes the truth of what Jesus can do. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Again, the kingdom language, the fulfillment of the kingdom. And Jesus promises him just that. This day you will be with me in paradise. As everyone else is making fun of Jesus, is mocking Jesus, is belittling Jesus, who think Jesus is exactly where he belongs. What they need to hear is again the words that Jesus says as he's on the cross. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. So Jesus is already offering them forgiveness before they even have recognized that they've done something wrong. And possibly that is what the good thief heard and recognized the truth of what was happening here. And most likely there is a chance he would have been there before Pilate because he's about to be crucified too. So, you know, he probably heard this whole thing going on between Pilate and the Sanhedrin and and Jesus and all that was happening. And he recognized the truth of his own brokenness and his need for Jesus, the innocent one. And then, of course, as Jesus, Father, into your hands, I commend my spirit, he makes it very clear who God is. They'd asked him earlier, are you saying you're the son of God? And now he's making it really clear. Yep, I am. Father, into your hands, I commend my spirit. But then let's look at what happens with the centurion. This man was innocent beyond all, beyond doubt. The word innocent can also be translated as righteous. This man is righteous. This man is innocent. And all of the people who had been there making fun of him, what do they do? When all the people who had gathered for this spectacle saw what had happened, now you're wondering, why would these people be there? Well, quite honestly, throughout human history, 
it was not unusual for people to have picnics around capital crime, you know, when people were being hanged or being executed in some way. That it was a show, you know? And so a lot of them were there for the show. But what happens when Jesus dies? Something switches. And we're not told what it is. When all the people who had gathered for this spectacle saw what had happened, they returned home beating their breasts. They knew they had messed up. But there was no way to fix it. Now, there was a virtuous and righteous man named Joseph, who, though he was a member of the council, had not consented to their plan of action. He came from the Jewish town of Arimathea and was awaiting the kingdom of God. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. After he'd taken the body down, he wrapped it in a linen cloth and laid him in a rock-hewn tomb in which no one had yet been buried. It was the day of preparation, and the Sabbath was about to begin. The women who had come from Galilee with him followed behind, and when they had seen the tomb and the way in which his body was laid in it, they returned and prepared spices and perfumed oils. Then they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. Why didn't they just go right in and take care of the body? Because then they would have been impure for the Sabbath. Because if you touch a dead body in in Jewish law, you're impure for seven days. So that would make them impure for the Passover, for the Sabbath. So it is something they have to wait for. And, but they know exactly where to go and they're gonna have everything ready to take care of Jesus. Again, the last piece I want to focus on here is, again, going back to what we talked about of what Luke is most concerned about, which is the kingdom of God. And how does, how does he describe Joseph? He came from the Jewish town of Arimathea and was awaiting the kingdom of God. And that is what was right before him in the person of Jesus. The kingdom of God is not a place. It's a relationship. It's a relationship with Jesus. And we see that relationship most powerfully in this moment in what? In the good thief. He recognized his brokenness, his sinfulness, and he turned to Jesus and created a relationship and entered into the kingdom in that moment. This day you will be with me in paradise. Joseph is showing his relationship with Jesus by taking such care and concern because to bury the dead is one of the great mitzvahs of the Jewish people. It is something that even though touching the dead body might make you unclean, it is a responsibility to bury the dead. And so Joseph makes sure that that happens, that Jesus is cared for. Because the worst thing for a Jew is to be left unburied. And so Joseph makes sure that doesn't happen. As we've come through now the passion of Luke, And we've touched on sort of the major themes that we talked about from the beginning. And we've seen how they have played out. You know, how Luke talks to Theophilus and what he's preparing for. And he kind of laid, if you really listen to the story, it is laid out in a slight, it's the same story as Matthew and Mark. But there's a more orderly connection to everything that is happening in Luke so that it makes it clear that it really is connected to the fulfillment of the kingdom, the fulfillment of everything that Jesus is doing, and at the same time preparing for the acts of the apostles. So in one fell swoop, Luke 
has made it clear that this is about everything that has come before, and now he's preparing for what is about to come. And that's the power of the passion of Luke. Thank you. All right. Uh, so next week, uh, we will have the Gospel of John, uh, which is very different in its presentation of the Passion narrative than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So I look forward to seeing you if you're able to be here next week. God bless and have a great night. Thank you.